Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to Gun Lab. I'm Ian, and today we're taking a look at a project that you may recognize if you're a reader over at ForgottenWeapons.com. We have been working on, for some time, uh, making a reproduction of the Russian slash Chinese RP-46. Uh, this is an adapter to the DP series of light machine guns, and it converts them from using a, a 47 round pan magazine to using Maxim or uh, Goryanov belts. It was a, a good way to modernize the gun for a relatively little cost. And they're really cool, and they're very rare, and we want them. And we can't afford to buy originals, so we figured we'd uh, see if we can't whip up a reproduction. This looks relatively simple. There aren't any, you know, all the moving parts are fairly small. They're all, it looks like a good project to do. You know, we've got this, we've got that, we've got this. But none of, you know, none of them look all that gnarly. So... We have this whole um, item in uh, SolidWorks. We put together a model, and then we went and used a 3D printer and made ourselves printouts of all the components. I left all the small ones off because they're not important at this point. And we figured what we do today is take a look at what it really takes to manufacture something like this. So let's start with the top piece, this guy. Um, the starting material for this one is fairly easy. We're going to use a block of steel that's this thick in the back and then has at least the overall dimensions uh, of the other two sides. So we can actually start with a solid block. Um, there's a lot of material to remove, but it's not prohibitively expensive or anything. But when we started looking at this and, and planning out how we were going to machine it, we realized you need probably seven, if not eight, different setups in the in a, a three-axis CNC machining center to do this. So, and for each one, by the way, you have to figure out exactly how you're going to clamp the material to keep it nice and rigid while you're doing an operation. So let's just take a look through here. We're going to need one setup to cut this flat surface, this flat surface. We can cut this radius here, or this side. And we can cut this, this notch, and this side from the top. And we can do this surface. However, before we can do anything on the underside, we have to tip it up on its side and do one, two, three holes. We need to do those while there's solid material in all of them. And that would have to be done first, almost. Right. Then we have to tip it up again on this side to do the same thing with this hole. So that's three operations. Going back to the top, we have this angled plane right here. There's no way we can cut this from just coming in from the top because we have a sharp angle right here where this plane and this plane intersect. Because a, a CNC machining center is going to operate with a, a cutting tool that spins and comes down vertically, there's no way that a rotating tool can cut a sharp edge like that. So in order to do that, we need to have a separate setup to lift the part up on its side like this at an angle so that this plane is perpendicular to our cutter. And then we can machine a nice flat surface there with a sharp edge. When we finally get to the inside, we see we have the, the parallel of that one slope right here. So we need to set it up on an angle again to cut this and this. We have, let's see, we have a separate angle. And again, you know, this is just one little cut, but it's got a nice sharp edge where it intersects right here. So this, has to be set up on an angle again and cut that way. So that's uh, five, I think, that we're up to. Then we're going to set it actually flat and do, well, actually, I'm sorry, before we can do that, we have to set it up here and cut out this plane. We're going to do that with a rotary cutter that comes in here, has enough clearance to get past this surface, comes in, down, and then we can follow the profile of this feedway. Cut that in. Then we can set it flat, come in with another cutter, and remove all of this material. There is quite a bit of surfacing that needs to be done here, where we have compound curves that are meeting and intersecting. Um, that can be done with a CNC, but it, it takes it's a little more complex to program. Uh, you definitely need to have a, a program like Mastercam to do that. 
Now, you may be wondering, well, you know, crap, the Soviets, the Chinese were making these in the mid-1940s. If it's so difficult, how did they do it? Well, the answer is, they did it a lot differently than we do it today. Today we're using a CNC machining center, three-axis, and what's important about that is that it uses a vertical tool that spins like this and, and comes down into the part, and then our part moves around. On an old, in a Chinese factory making these, or a Russian factory, or even an American gun making factory at the time, this would have been made with a bank of horizontal milling machines primarily, where you have a cutter that, that runs along an axis this way, spins like this, and you'd have a, you know, your cutting tool would be this long, this wide, and it would be contoured to match this surface. So one cutting tool can cut this flat, this semicircle, this flat, this angle, and this flat, just by running the part through once under the cutting tool, or twice if you have to take off a lot of material. Once that's done, you don't mess with the machine at all, it simply goes to another horizontal milling machine that's set up to do a different cut. Say, I don't know, maybe uh, this at the back. This here. Right, yeah. And any one of the, most, most of the, the operations on this can be set up as passes through different uh, tools on a horizontal milling machine. And that's how it would have been done. These factories, you know, the, those are very simple machine tools. You set them up once, they're very well suited to unskilled labor. All the guy has to do is mount a piece in a vise, clamp it down, you know, a specific fixture, clamp it down, run it through his machine, put it into the basket at the end, pick up another piece, and start the process over. So adapting that to today's CNC machining can be a little tricky. Um, for example, if you take a look at a 100-year-old design like the 1911 versus a modern design like the Glock, you'll see that the Glock has a lot fewer radiuses, radii, has a lot fewer compound radii in particular, and it's set up so that you can clamp the piece once and do as much machining as possible without removing it. Whereas the 1911 is designed to, have to be clamped a whole bunch of different times in different machines. Um, we had the opportunity to go to the uh, Fabrique Nationale plant in Herstal, Belgium, and one of the things that we saw there was they still have a setup like this for making uh, Browning high-powered barrels. They have about 35 machines in a row. They're all very simple machines, and they're all set up to do one, one specific operation. You put the part in, you run it through, you take it out, and it goes to the next machine. And it makes large-scale production of, of components like this very easy, even though they look very complex. And in fact, they are complex to make on today's tooling. So. You know, a lot of people would just naturally think, well, you need this, you put it in the CNC, and the machine goes blah, 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 and does it all. Well, the reality is it's, it's not like that. Um, machines have very specific and very real limitations, and you have to work around them. Um, let's take a look at another part, this guy. This is the slide that actually goes back and forth. It picks up cartridges uh, from the, the belt here. The cartridge comes down, this picks it up, runs it forward brings it back and ejects it. And on this, we have a couple of different issues. First of all, I know someone's going to suggest we should start this by taking a big block of steel that's large enough in all three dimensions to encompass this part and we just machine everything away. And that would work. However, it would remove an incredible amount of material that would be wasted. Uh, we might be able to save some of that by using some saw cutting operations, you know, to cut out a big block here. Uh, but that gets pretty time-consuming, because uh, that all has to be done manually. We also have, um, well, one, one alternative we looked at, first possible alternative, is finding a piece of stock material that is an angle bracket that can encompass both this and this piece. Now, you do have to keep in mind we've got these two uh, blocks at the back. So the top of our stock material has to be about 0.8 inches thick, which is awfully thick for angle bracket. Um, if we did that, this would work fairly well. We'd have a lot of material to remove up here, but that's doable. Um, another option would be making this out of a piece of rectangular stock so that we can get these guys in, and then having these, this bottom piece done as a separate part. Water jet cut it out initially and then mill it down to the exact dimensions that we need and then weld it on. 
Which again, this sounds, sounds like a good solution. Uh, just weld them together, right? Well, not so much. If you look at this, we have some square edges down here. If we're going to put this on and weld it, we're going to get a fillet, you know, a radius weld. We have to machine that down to a nice square, and when we do that, we've cut away our whole weld, and there's very little holding this in place anymore. Well, a workaround for that would be to cut a groove in this part and make this a little bit taller than it needs to be so that we can actually drop this into this flat piece and then cut a, a groove and fill it with weld, which would be a decent workaround, except on the very opposite side of this, we have a channel cut out, and the material thickness at the bottom here is really, really thin. If we tried to cut a groove for this in here, we'd basically break through into this track. And again, you have no material to actually weld on. So we're not entirely sure how we're going to go about this particular one yet. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting to point out when you take, even, you know, even a, a piece that's pretty simple like this, it's not that complicated, you really have to consider how exactly you're going to manufacture it. Um, another, here, here's another example. When we're cutting this out, we have to clamp it in place securely so it doesn't vibrate. Because if, if we just put a couple of, of vice flats here and we come in to cut this, this piece is going to start vibrating in and out and it's going to be impossible to machine it cleanly to get the right dimensions. Same thing even more so with this guy. So what we would need to do is, for example, while this is all solid, clamp it here, come in and make a relatively small cut in this end or in here, and then make ourselves a special fixture that holds the part at the edges and also has a block sticking up of exactly the right dimension to support uh, this. And then with that supported, then we can come in and machine out the interior. Something like that has to be done. Um, all of these processes, you really have to pay attention to what order things are done in because machining one thing out can make it impossible to make to do the next step. So there's a lot of thought process that has to go in to a manufacturing part. A lot of people think that CNC machinery is just magic. You plug in a, a 3D drawing file and push the button and the machine just makes it happen. And that's not the case at all. These machines have very real and very specific limitations that you have to work around. Uh, if you're designing something for a CNC machine, then you can really work to its strengths um, and produce really cool stuff really, really fast. But when we're trying to reproduce parts that were made on a completely different kind of machine with the CNC, um, it takes quite a bit of time and effort, uh, or, or thought at least. So we don't know exactly when we're going to have uh, these RP46 covers done. Um, we kind of announced them a little bit, well, a lot bit, way too early over on Forgotten Weapons. And I apologize for that. We thought it'd go a little quicker than it has. But I figured this would be an interesting to look at from an interesting thing to look at from a manufacturing perspective. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, don't forget to tune back into gunlab.net for more information on firearms design and manufacturing. And uh, thanks for watching.